Good morning, everybody. Hello. Can we all sit down? Uh, I'm going to start just a couple of minutes early because, as you can see, we have some special guests here uh, this morning. So we thought that to give our annual public meeting a slightly different flavour from the normal um, reading out of all of the reports and accounts and so on, uh, which, of course, I'm afraid you're going to get anyway uh, later on. But we did think that it would be really nice um, for everybody to listen to the Epsom and St. Helier Choir. We're going to do a few uh, tunes, some of which they uh, prepared themselves, some of which you'll, you'll know, just by means of really welcome and introduction to our public meeting. So, without any uh, further ado, I'd like to hand you over to the choir. <laughs> Yakusina la du banaha. Si 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 tolada. Yakusina la du banaha. Banaha. Si 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 tolada. Yakusina la du banaha. Oh, my God. 
very, very much. That's really brilliant. Lovely. Oh, you composed the song? I did. Yes. Oh, yeah. Fantastic. Very well done. Thank you very much for introducing our annual public meeting in a different and much more, much more pleasant way than, uh, than we normally do it. Um, I'm afraid we've now got to get down to uh, the business. But thank yes, so much. Thank you very much. Sorry, can I ask you a question? Yes, of course. What language was that you were singing in English? Um, I've got one in Swahili. Yeah. Yeah. Is it in Suffolk Koso, isn't it? Koso. It was originally it was originally a, a, a Southampton, a South African one, which was picked up by the by the Dutch. It was fantastic, actually. It really was. The other thing I wanted to say to you, I thought your composition knew that it's brilliant. Now, have you recorded that? Have you even thought about recording? Oh yes. Getting it onto CD. Yes, possibly. Well, I think we're going to do that definitely, because I honestly believe that that would actually. Uh, move an awful lot of people because it's a very, very powerful message. Very, very enjoyable. Thank, Thank you all you. very much. <laughs> That's it. Now, don't pack everyone down. Right, done. There you go. There you go. That's very brief. That was very, very impressive. <laughs> Right, I'm going to start. While the uh, choir is just tidying up, um, welcome. Sorry? Oh, you've got a slide. Oh, have I? I didn't know that. Thank you. That's my slide. I'm going to read it. Right. Thank you very much for coming. This is the annual public meeting. Um, slightly different in uh, format and indeed purpose to our normal public briefing. The annual public meeting is where the annual public meeting is where we report to you, the public, on all aspects of our performance over the last uh, financial year, uh, which we report, which is um, April nine, uh, 2017 to April end of March 2018 and we'll be talking to you about our quality, about our finance and about our performance. We'll then go on to talk about um, various aspects of the future but primarily this is our review of the year and so it wouldn't be right for me to start the review of the year without um, saying thank you. Thank you very much to all our staff who are wonderful, our, our volunteers. We have several hundred volunteers now, and uh, I read the other day that uh, the NHS wouldn't be able to continue without its volunteers, and in many ways that is absolutely true. They do an absolutely fantastic job in all uh, areas of, of, uh, of the hospitals. I'd particularly like to thank everybody who has raised funds for us throughout the year. Um, many of you are in this room, and I think that uh, we are incredibly grateful for everything that you do for us and everything you do for the Trust because it all impacts on the people, the people in uh, South West London, the people in Epsom and surrounding areas who benefit from everything you do in fundraising. So that's a really, really important uh, element of, of our being able to give fantastic service to everybody and we thank you very much for that. I'd like to thank my board colleagues, um, my executive directors who uh, do this job, well I was going to say Monday to Friday 9 to 5 but it's far, far, far more than that. It's all the time basically and they uh, are such a dedicated and inspirational team. We are very, very lucky to have the executive directors that we do have in this trust. And uh, believe me, I can tell you when I hear sometimes from other trust chairs about some of the challenges they face in recruiting really high quality executive directors, um, we are very, very, very privileged and uh, grateful to have the 
quality and experience of the exec directors that we have. I'd also like to pay a tribute to my fellow non-executive directors, um, drawn from uh, many areas of experience, many professions, many uh, interesting and different backgrounds. Um, I think they're pretty well all in the room today. And once again, a huge thank you to the non-exec directors, without which many of the things that go on behind the scenes, which perhaps the public don't see very much, the committees that they chair, the interview panels for new consultants that they chair, the various other activities that they uh, take responsibility for, absolutely vital for the way that the Trust continues to operate. And once again, a heartfelt thank you to all the non-executive directors. Thank you also to our partners, many in the room, uh, Health Watch and all our uh, other partners in the local authority, uh, in the Health and Wellbeing Board and so on. They are really, really important to us. They act as our critical friends and they really help to keep us um, very, very attuned to what is actually going on in the, in the hospitals. They have a, if you like, a slightly different route into the knowledge of uh, where we are in terms of our patients and what our patients and staff and our patients' families are thinking and feeling. And it's really important that um, we work closely with them and thank you very much for them. And then finally, from me, thank you to all of you. Um, you are a very uh, engaged and active um, audience. You're, I've no doubt you'll have lots of questions for us later on. Um, it's really important for us that we do engage as far as we can and as much as we can with the public and uh, the people with whom we serve. And it's great that you come along and show such commitment to Epsom St. Helia. So, that's what I wanted to say, and I'd like to now hand over initially to Daniel, who will take you through, if you like, the headlines. Thanks, Daniel. Thank you, Lawrence. So, a brief review of the year, but I think just about everyone in the room actually knows the whole year already, so I will go, uh, I'll canter through this bit. Um, so, our, uh, our now traditional, how do you get the whole year on an infographic page? Um, the... Uh, so 904,000 attendances uh, in the year. That's like 2,500 people using our services every day. Um, we delivered almost 95% for A&E at 93.15%. Uh, and the reason why it was a bit lower than the year before is the little amb ambulance picture at the bottom. There was a 20% increase in activity, emergency activity over the winter. That was a very sustained number of weeks this year. Um, we spent almost uh, 30 million pounds on our buildings uh, and uh, sorting out our buildings has become such a big thing that we actually are, we've asked Trevor to do a whole part of the presentation on capital. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll leave Trevor to tell you all the, uh, most of the great exciting things. Uh, and then the little piggy bank uh, being squeezed. Uh, we have delivered the financial plan that we were set and Rakesh is going to uh, tell you about that. Um, so in some of the key standards, I've just mentioned uh, A&E, we were just shy of the target. Uh, for 18 weeks, we were quite a long way off the target. Uh, we didn't plan to achieve the 18-week target uh, last year. And for this year, we have been given a new target of just keep the total waiting list the same as, uh, as it was at the beginning of the year by the end. Uh, for stroke care, we didn't achieve the standard of people spending the right amount of time on the stroke ward. Uh, that's a particular issue at Epsom, uh, and we will sort that out uh, this financial year. Um, we did achieve the standards for everyone being referred as an urgent referral for cancer within the, uh, the target. The cancer referrals now make up a third of our outpatient referrals. Uh, we, did achieve, we did achieve the treatment target of 31 days, uh, and we were a little way off the whole cancer pathway target of 62 days. However, since uh, March, we have met the target in March, April, and May. Um, some other highlights. So the first one, uh, in true NHS uh, acronyms, we're gonna get, we're gonna have an 1819 amnesty on acronyms, comms team. Uh, so HSMR, uh, so <coughs> that's mortality rates. Uh, and when we say we're in the top quarter, that means we're really safe. Uh, and James will uh, tell you uh, quite a lot about the quality uh, account indicators. Um, they are, we're really proud about hip fracture services, where we are the 
the best performing trust in London, so you are more <coughs> likely to get better and not die if you break your hip in Sutton and Epsom than in any other part of the capital. Um, and uh, we have done a lot to improve uh, sepsis, which is about infection. Um, so this is the back page of the Wimbledon, Sutton and Epsom Guardians this week. Uh, all the money we have been spending on improving uh, our uh, estate. Uh, I hope you have noticed uh, uh, some of, at least some of the things. Um, I mean, some of the things you won't have seen, so in the top left corner, so replacing all the dishwashers for cleaning all the endoscopes for the two day surgery and endoscope uh, endoscopy units, that was a massive investment to ensure we complied with all the best infection control. And you probably won't have seen the bottom right either, because that's buried at the top of the water tower at St. Helier, the, the water tank uh, replacing the 1930s version. But I'll leave Trevor to do the, uh, the, the most of it. But just, to, just admire Trevor smiling. So, cutting that ribbon there, which was for the, uh, the disabled access lift in Ferguson House, that was quite some project that uh, encountered every conceivable Epsom and Hellier estate issue you could imagine uh, in trying to build something uh, new in 80-year-old estate. Um, there's loads we can be proud about, uh, and of course the, ele the elective orthopaedic centre at Epsom, it is outstanding uh, and goes from strength to strength. Uh, uh, the, um, as we understand it, it is the only orthopaedic centre uh, in the country that was actually able to deliver within the money that has, was set aside for orthopaedics for last year, uh, and it didn't compromise any quality standards, uh, and uh, the surgeons uh, carry on loving it, as do the patients. Um, we have been doing a lot to pioneer integrated care in our catchment. So the top line is the Epsom story, uh, where we started with Epsom Health and Care, which you know about, which was an alliance of those four organisations. Uh, and from October, it becomes the Integrated Dorking Epsom and East Elmbridge Alliance, where the partners will be providing community services as well as hospital services for the whole of Surrey Downs. Uh, and it involves all the GP practices, including in the parts of Surrey Downs that do not use Epsom as their district hospital. Um, so, every, so that's the Elmbridge bit and the Dorking bit. Uh, it's really exciting. And the, uh, the bottom line of the chart is about Sutton. So we started with the, the Care Home Vanguard, that was the red bag. Uh, and in April, we launched Sutton Health and Care, which is a partnership of all those uh, organizations to replicate Epsom Health and Care. And when we come to do this next year, the, the, the bit of the journey will be Sutton Health and Care taking on all the community service, health services in Sutton from April next year. Um, you all know we've been CQC inspected. Uh, that they came in the most difficult week of the whole year, the first working week in January. Um, you can see in the little table at the bottom that we now have two goods. Uh, we have a good for caring and a good for uh, responsive across the trust. Uh, we are still requires improvement overall, but in just about every service, there was just one where they inspected. In every other service they inspected, we had improved significantly from where uh, we were before. This is the St. Helier grid now for the CQC, and you can see it is predominantly green, uh, and the St. Helier site would be green overall if one yellow square was in a slightly different place in the grid. Uh, the, um, uh, and I won't bore you with the technicalities of how the CQC uh, actually come out with their overall rating. Uh, the Epsom grid looks less green, but that's predominantly because they didn't have enough inspectors, and they decided not to inspect lots of the services at Epsom. Uh, so they beautifully told us they're coming back later in the year to do some more surfaces at Epsom. Um, and Swellyock uh, remains as outstanding. Um, so we've now got no reds. We've got a large number of areas moving from requires improvement to good. We've got more greens than ambers. Um, and 10 uh, good services overall. Um, however, they did give us some regulatory breaches uh, about compliance with the Mental Capacity Act the board assurance framework, governance and record keeping. Um, and then really importantly for us, that some staff told them that they perceive they're not being treated fairly. Uh, and we have a huge piece of work uh, underway, which I'll come on to in a minute to uh, uh, try and rectify that. Um, and then uh, we, we, have the, we have this wonderful conversation at the board meeting last, last time. We didn't achieve our own internal target of 95% for statutory and mandatory training whereas other trusts have a much lower target and achieve it, and then the CQC say that's fine. So we're going to have a conversation about what we do about our internal target. 
Um, the things that we absolutely need to do coming out of the CQC report, a lot of the, um, uh, the requires improvement at St. Helier relates to the estate, uh, and in particular to A&E and critical care, which are on the plan for this year to fix, um, and mandatory training, mental health has been covered. And then this is our big uh, conversation we're going to have with 5,000 staff called Your Voice, Your Values, Let's Make Epsom St. Helier Outstanding. Um, we're aiming to do a whole cultural survey this summer, and then in September we are going to organise for every single member of staff to have the opportunity over a week to spend two hours talking about what's important to them about <laughs> working in Epsom and St Helier and what we need to do to make it a better place to uh, work. Uh, and my weekly message to all the staff today is all about teeing that up and setting that conversation going. Um, the, uh, I've already said they're coming back. Um, the, uh, and in their CQC's own words, we're in touching distance of being good. So there we go. That's an overview of the year. And now, talk about quality. James. Thank you, Daniel. I, I'd like to talk you through the quality accounts. Um, they are available in hard copy on the table at the back. Um, so if any of you want to take a copy away with you um, and have a little bit of bedtime reading, um, I'd recommend that for you. So, so what are the quality accounts? The quality accounts are um, our key quality priorities that we determine at the start of each year for where we want to focus our attention um, on improving the quality of care that we offer to our patients. And to a certain degree, they are co-designed with some of our key stakeholders, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, and then we listen to the views uh, of our stakeholders and design what our priorities are going to be. They're aimed to try and provide assurance both to the board and to our communities that we are continuing to deliver and enhance high quality services. And there are three key domains um, of quality that we are looking at related to patient safety, the outcomes of care that we offer, and patient experience and there are two key priorities in each of these domains. So our first priority for last year was to maintain a focus on infection control. Um, so we did a lot of work in terms of trying to em embrace the absolute basics of hand hygiene, attention to detail, ensuring that we have key policies in place making sure that we perform robust audits and start to have a culture of challenging members of staff who don't utilize the basics of um, infection control principles. We set ourselves a target of having uh, fewer than 39 episodes of Clostridium difficile infection. And you can see from the chart at the top um, that we just missed this target, we had 40 episodes through the year. The chart does show that over the last five or six years, we have moved in the right direction, but we still have more work to do in this. The other key area that we wanted to focus on was reducing the numbers of patients who have an MRSA bacteremia. And quite rightly, we should have a zero tolerance to people experiencing an MRSA um, um, systemic infection. In the year we had five episodes where people had an MRSA infection um, so we did miss that target but again we have made some progress over the last five or six years but undoubtedly have more work to do on this. The second priority relates to ensuring that we are learning from deaths within our hospital. The chart um, demonstrates the hospital standardized mortality ratio, or the HSMR, and it demonstrates that we consistently are, have good outcomes and that we are fundamentally safe in that our mortality rates are lower than the national average. However, there are always important lessons to be learned when people die in our care and what we wanted to focus on is how can we embed systems that we have a more systematic approach to learning from deaths. So 
We, this has become a national priority and it's been quite high profile. So we have set up mortality groups, we've set up um, and trained key senior clinicians to start to undertake very detailed mortality reviews and we're starting to get some um, quite um, good learning from this. It's at early stages in terms of making this really strong and embedded with all of our clinical divisions and we want to strengthen this through the next year. In terms of outcomes, a, a very major national priority is to improve the outcomes of patients who have sepsis. Sepsis can lead to a high mortality rate. And this was um, our own local priority to improve the recognition and management of patients who present to our hospitals with suspected sepsis. We undertook a, a very large um, education campaign and training campaign um, and we've got lots of stickers in the blood culture packs to remind doctors and nurses how to recognize and to instigate prompt action for patients who have sepsis. The chart shows, that the blue lines show that our recognition and early treatment of sepsis within the accident and emergency department has improved very significantly, but we have got more work to do to get this fully embedded on the wards. The fourth priority was to work with our external stakeholders to reduce potential avoidable hospital admissions and readmissions. As Daniel mentioned, the Epsom Health and Care Service was developed to enable coordinated care to be provided for those people over the age of 65 through integrated multidisciplinary team around the Epsom area. The chart demonstrates what's happened in terms of the um, non-elective admissions to Epsom Hospital for people over the age of 65. The red line shows the admission rates in 1617 and the blue line those last year. And there was a consistent reduction of non-elective admissions in the Epsom area by about 6% month on month. In comparison at the St. Helier end, where we had not yet developed the sudden health and care, we saw a 6% rise in non-elective admissions, which is in line with what other trusts have seen locally and nationally. So it has become a priority to try and get the lessons learned from Epsom Health and Care and embed this in the Sutton area with Sutton Health and Care. And we've decided to keep this as a key priority for this year. In terms of patient experience, our fifth priority was to demonstrate a continuous improvement in the patient experience. We've progressed a patient experience dashboard to get much better and objective feedback from various sources such as complaints, NHS choices, the PAL service, the patient advisory and liaison service, and social media. We've engaged with patients who have been telling us their stories about things that have gone well and things that have gone less well from their experience, and we've had their permission to embed these stories in our training um, for staff and had very good feedback from staff about how it resonates with them. The complaints process has undergone a comprehensive review as we've recognised that historically we've been quite slow at responding to complaints and we're definitely moving in the right direction with the responsiveness of our complaint service. The sixth and final priority was to improve the lived experience of people who have dementia and their loved ones. We've worked with organisations such as Dementia Care Matters to train 45 key members of staff to undertake audits um, and to help embed learning across some of our key wards and particularly the care of the elderly wards. Um, we've also trained 247 members of staff to attend a study day at Kingston University to help look after patients with dementia and reviewed the patient care pathway for patients who present to the emergency department where they're particularly vulnerable. So when deciding the key priorities for 2018-19, we've engaged with senior members of staff within the trust and um, our stakeholders, such as Health Watch and local commissioning groups. And this has resulted in a number of changes in what our priorities are 
for this year moving forward. So our first priority has changed in that we want to improve the proportion of patients who are seen on a daily basis by consultants. And we intend to do this by reviewing the job plans of consultants to ensure that they have enough time in their workflow to provide enough care on the wards on a regular basis. We want to implement standardised performers so that we can record the decisions in a much more objective and standardised way and continue to participate in the national seven-day audit so that we can benchmark how we are doing against other trusts in the country. The patient experience domain priorities have changed. So priority five um, has been predominantly to look at improving the patient experience within the emergency department as our feedback in this area has been less positive in 17-18. And the sixth priority has changed to strengthen the trust's involvement with carers, as this is a very important component of care. You'll notice if you read the quality account that we have received responses from some of our key stakeholders who, who are listed above. And I'll just read out some of the key themes from um, the stakeholders. So, Whilst the stakeholders have recognised a number of the challenges that we face, we've had a number of very helpful and positive comments too. Healthwatch Sutton explained that the Trust has been proactive in addressing issues around patient experience. They also mentioned that work is being jointly undertaken to improve patient experience in the emergency department at St Helier. The Healthier Communities and Older People Overview and Scrutiny Panel for the London Borough of Merton stated that they had heard many positive tes testimonials from local residents about the excellent care received at St Helia. Sutton Clinical Commissioning Group explained that the quality account accurately reflected the national and local priorities for the trust within the wider healthcare economy. They thanked us for the work that we'd undertaken within 1718 to improve patient safety and experience and commented on all the work that had been carried out in response to the Care Quality Commission's inspection in November 2015, which had been recognised in the latest report in the inspection that Daniel has just referred to. Sutton CCG were particularly proud of the initial steps that have been taken to launch Sutton Health and Care, which hopefully will reduce avoidable admissions, readmissions, length of stay, and the quality of care that's offered to some of the vulnerable patients in the Sutton catchment. <coughs> and finally, Surrey Downs Clinical Commissioning Group were pleased to see the progress that improvements have been made across the trust, and they noted notice, noticeable improvements in the management of complaints and patient feedback, with a focus on learning that can be shared and embedded across the organisation. The introduction of a robust process for learning from deaths, the Epsom Health and Care model being developed and embedded within Epsom Hospital. And Surrey Downs were pleased to see the improvements that have been made in the latest CQC report following the latest inspection. And finally, they welcomed the opportunity to participate in developing the priorities for 1819. I'll hand you over to Rakesh, who'll talk through the annual accounts. Um, Daniel mentioned in his slide earlier that um, we put our, our finances under, under control, but um, there are a number of uh, financial performance targets that we are set that, taken in the round, describe the financial health of the organisation, but also gives assurance to our regulators that the money that Parliament have set aside is used appropriately. Um, and some of them, unfortunately, are, are fairly dry and, and technical in nature. But I'll go, th I'll go through those initially. So the first, the first slide shows how we did against our income and expenditure budgets. So in 1718, we had agreed with our regulators that we would post a deficit of 17.8 million pounds, um, control total. Uh, we actually posted a, a lower deficit than that at 13.4 million pounds. And so we um, overachieved our target by 4.4 million pounds. We still recognize it's a deficit, uh, and, we still re and we recognize the reasons for that, but 
So from a KPI, from a uh, performance perspective, we overachieved on our income and expenditure budgets. And that would be, the th that would be three years in a row where we've either achieved or exceeded our control total. However, we have to recognize that over the years we've made deficits and the cumulative deficit has now risen to nearly 80 million pounds. What this slide shows are the more technical, drier performance targets we set. So the first one, external finance limit, it refers to the way we manage cash. Parliament and Department of Health are, are very, very exercised about how we manage cash and cash management is a key work stream for us and again we managed our cash with, within our resources and actually had four four and a half million pounds more in the bank than we were mandated to have similarly capital resource limit daniel talked about us spending nearly 30 million pounds in 1718 and and uh, we'll be spending a further 50 million pounds capital allocation comes from a different budget from dh and again, there's high degrees of scrutiny of how we spend it, and we were within our target again for our capital resource limit. All trusts are required to make a 3.5% dividend payment back to the government, uh, and we achieved that as well. The last two I've spoken at board on every occasion we go through the finance report, and this is where we pay our suppliers on a timely basis. And you can see from the previous years, we've, we've improved. And you'll also notice we always prioritize non-NHS suppliers before NHS suppliers. And these, this of numbers are the best in Southwest London. So in briefly, I've talked about it. So we, we, did, we ended the year better than we had initially planned. And how did the trust achieve this? In, in broad, big, broad terms, we received 8.7 million pounds of sustainability and transformation funding. Uh, for achieving the, finance, the financial target um, uh, and because we overachieved we were given a bonus of a further five million pounds in recognition of, of, of that. Uh, we sold land at the Sutton site, uh, the sales proceeds were 14.1 million pounds and we made profit of 10.6 million pounds and the trust has worked normally, uh, tremendously hard and we've actually made savings, efficiency savings and cost reduction savings of just under 13 million pounds, which is on par with most trusts in London. Uh, another key, another, another key um, target that has been set by our regulators, NHS Improvement, is how much money we spent on agency staff. Uh, you'll, you'll appreciate the premium associated with, with agency staff is high. So we have a lot of focus on that and we were set a target of uh, 11.6 million and we spent less than that. So I, the, last, the next two slides very briefly talk about where our, where our income comes from, where our money comes from and what we spend it on. So predominantly nearly 90% of our income comes from our CCGs and predominantly from Surrey Downs and from Sutton. So they, they equate to about half each of that 90, 90 odd percent. Our income last year was um, nearly 400 million pounds and it rises further in, in 1819 to around 420 million pounds. And where do we spend the money? Well, the top three items, you won't be surprised, is staff, 60%, fo followed by clinical supplies, ranging from very technical um, prosthesis to syringe, syringes, and lastly on drugs. So what does 1819 look like? Uh, we've agreed a control total, which is a really challenging control total for deficit of 13.7 million pounds. Uh, it does get harder and harder to deliver cost improvement programs, so this is a very, very challenging target. Uh, we have a group, the system has said that if we achieve our financial and A&E targets, we will receive 14.5 million pounds of uh, sustainability transformation funding. We have a very ambitious and stretching target to deliver 17 million pounds of the cost improvement I referred to earlier. And we also have plans to sell part of the surplus site or Epsom. Uh, and this, and We've talked about the, our active participation in the various systems work. 
I'll hand over. Thank you, Rakesh. Um, I think um, I have the pleasure of actually spending some money and actually doing some improvements. But I think, first of all, just I'm sure most people were, but just actually some of the challenges that we have in our state. So we, we have across Epsom and St Helia over £126 million of backlog maintenance uh, issues. So what that is very much about the money that we need to invest just to actually bring the actual environment, the patient um, clinical areas, up to an acceptable standard. Within that um, money, there's over £60 million of what we call critical infrastructure, so really um, urgent requirement works to actually maintain our buildings. We do have an ageing estate over here at St Helia, our estate over 80 years old, um, and there's parts of Epsom that's over 50 uh, years of, of age. Um, unfortunately in 2015, due to some of the conditions certainly on the St Helia site, we had a regulatory breach by the CQC, um, and that related to B and C block, and you can see we come on to that, but work have started. Um, but also importantly that we do have uh, the functionality of our state is very poor in terms of it designed 80 years ago, 50 years ago, doesn't really meet modern healthcare. And I don't know if you can, you can see, but certainly you can see St Helens at the bottom, Epsom at the top. The red is unacceptable condition of functional suitability and the, the, the mauve colour is very much still of a really poor standard. So it just shows you some of the, the work that we still need to do in actually making um, our buildings fit for modern healthcare. I am pleased to say that um, over three financial years, starting in 2016, uh, we have secured £100 million to improve the estate and, and put some, some money into to actually addressing the, those um, challenges. So we obviously focusing on improving the uh, environment for our patients. Uh, we are working very much with clinicians and other and just partners to actually how we deliver that. It's a real challenge spending that sort of money in an operational um, hospital, um, so we are working with our colleagues. Um, but also, we know it's not just our state, we have to invest in our IT and modernise our um, clinical systems, so we are putting money into that as well. Um, and the other thing, obviously, we want to make sure we're trying to reduce our operational costs, so we, we also trying to improve energy efficiency um, and reduce our carbon footprint. Some of this to, to fund the money we have, we are having to rationalise our estates, so we do know that we've disposed of land over on the Sutton site last year. This year we are planning to actually rationalise um, part of the Epsom site um, to help us improve the condition of our estate and of that money to invest in the core areas. Um, and we're looking at certainly focusing on some of that critical infrastructure work in terms of our engineering, our water, our electricity, our heating systems. Um, and obviously we're trying to do that, we're also working in terms of our future 2020-2030 vision. The, just in uh, last year, we um, had a record investment of 20, just to mention it, about 28 million. Um, and during that year, we spent um, just over 8 million pounds on addressing backlog uh, challenges um, at Epsom St Helier. So not really much that we can visually show you, but it's behind the scenes, it's roofs, it's heating, boilers uh, and plant. We also spent um, near enough seven million pounds on actually Im improving the patient environment, uh, including sort of um, enablers to uh, improve our renal services, intensive care, and surgical ambulatory care. We um, invested in expanding our emergency departments and providing urgent treatment centres on both Epsom and St Helier Hospital. And um, as I said earlier, we have been spent some money on uh, improving our IT systems. But also, it's important that we have to maintain and keep up to date all of our medical equipment. So we did spend over two million pounds on medical equipment. Just in terms of some of the details around those schemes from, from last year, we, on the St Helier site, we provided a, a state-of-the-art new um, audiology department that's now located on the first floor of Ferguson House. Um, and we also uh, relocated our antenatal and um, uh, pediatric, children pediatric outpatient functions into Langley Wing and, and that was very much welcome in terms of previously there was in a, in a not a very light um, window orientated space and they've got much more space now. We have um, expanded both as I said earlier our urgent treatment centres at both sites and that's in effect doubled our capacity. 
we've upgraded a Mary Moore ward. I'm not sure if many people know the Mary Moore ward on this site. It was very much um, internal, didn't have much light, had heating uh, issues as well. We've actually now put some uh, windows in, so you can actually see out, and actually improved the environment uh, in terms of the um, comfort. We've um, delivered a new CT scanner at St. Telly as well, uh, and that's really much about um, improving our capacity for diagnostic weights, but also to give us some resilience if wherever we come down for maintenance of our CT scanner, provide emergency care. We've delivered a new surgical care suite for all our pa planned surgery at Epsom. So it's much more improved uh, reception, uh, one shot stop, and much more um, streamlined pathway for patients. You're in our new uh, education centre uh, that has been uh, refurbished and brought all of our staff and doctors' medical training into one environment. And we're, we're actually also delivered new retail facilities on both our hospitals to improve the experience for our patients, visitors and staff. And as you see over there again, we have actually started our £12 million investment into um, the external refurbishment of B&C blocks to actually uh, make it fit for continued healthcare. So coming on to, to uh, this year, this financial year, we um, have a record £50 million investment, which is uh, certainly a challenge to, to uh, deliver in one financial year, but we'll, we'll achieve it. We're, we're looking at just under £12 million on new energy uh, efficiency uh, schemes on both our sites. Currently, we have still steam generation that we're providing heating hot water to both our hospitals. Um, it's really not state-of-the-art um, facilities, and by replacing them, putting combined heat and power plants in, uh, we will certainly improve the, um, the services we've got, reduce our clinical backlog, but also make some significant revenue savings from our energy bills. We're looking at just under £10 million on providing a new critical care facilities, surgical and bleaching care facilities for our patients, and, and also um, a new renal dialysis facility. Over at Epsom, we're looking at spending just over £7 million in rationalising the, 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 this, the actual site and some of the stuff around that we'll come on to, but it's actually improving the patient experience and the environment that those patients are in. We'll continue to heavily invest in our medical equipment. With this year, a record £3 million on medical equipment and continue the journey of, digital, uh, of improvement and modernising our IT systems with over £3 million. And lastly, which is probably very uh, close to some of our staff, actually providing a new nursery, uh, state-of-the-art uh, nursery for staff. For their children. For, yeah, for their children, yes. <laughs> Thanks, David. <laughs> I think, um, so just going a bit more detail around some of that work, um, we'll be completing this year um, BNC block. It's planned to be completed around uh, December time. Uh, we may be carrying on a little bit more work past that, but predominantly the main works to our wards will be completed. We um, continue to ex further expansion of our emergency department, uh, certainly um, um, in terms of the, um, the emergency pathways, our resus and, and urgent, uh, sorry, um, majors areas. We're um, going to continue providing new surgical and electric care at, at St. Helia, next to Mary Moore, so it's a, a much more improved environment and pathway. And, and over at um, Epsom, we're going to continue to provide a new um, day recovery ward um, right next to our day surgery uh, unit. We will be delivering new homes for renal dialysis, um, uh, that's at St. Helia and also at Croydon. Uh, we've delivered that, um, and we've also uh, moved our chronic fatigue, um, pain and phlebotomy services from the Sutton Old Melvin Centre to a new facility at the front. Um, and in terms of um, moving forward in terms of next year, just to finish off some of the things that we're doing is that we'll be completing um, obviously our energy efficiency projects, that's over £20 million that we're looking at green investment money from the Mayor of London. Um, and that will finish off, including um, LED lighting, some other control measures. We'll complete our new ITU HDU facility at St. Helia. And we're also going to be expanding our um, woodcoat wing uh, at Epsom uh, and putting some, uh, a new uh, mansard roof on the uh, woodcoat wing to improve and co-locate all our outpatient services into one building. 
and that will also include putting in an x-ray facility. So instead of coming to eight patients and then trying to find your way around the hospital to find x-ray, it will be all in the same building, which will improve the patient experience. We're also looking at relocating all that inpatient renal. Um, for people that it's all at the back of the site here, all on single storeys, very much away from the hospital. We're looking at co-locating it all in our main wall blocks in A, B and C. And finally, we're looking at putting in a um, new deck car park at Epsom to improve car parking um, for patients and obviously for, for staff and visitors. And I think the last thing of the Epsom site is that we also put a bid in to look at how we can um, move the community um, bed provision at Epsom York Cush Hospital, along with the therapy, um, the community therapies, into one um, facility in Langley Wing at Epsom, so we can create much more of a community hub and um, hospital. Over to you, Lawrence. Thank you very much. Oh, is it Daniel? Daniel, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So, thank you very much. Um, so, so really quickly, because you all know all of this. Uh, so the long-term future of Epsom and St Helier. Uh, so we initiated the conversation by publishing our strategic outline case uh, last year. Uh, and we're now in a program called Improving Healthcare Together 2020 to 2030, led by Surrey Downs, Sutton and Merton CCGs. Um, and they are uh, launched the program to improve our clinical quality, to ensure we have fit for purpose modern buildings and enable us to achieve financial sustainability. Um, you will all know that we've now got to the part of the process where the commissioners have a case for change. They have developed a clinical model. They have a provision. They had a provisional long list. They applied, applied some tests to their long list and have ended up with a provisional short list. Uh, the short list looks spookily similar to the ideas that Epson and St Helia had uh, uh, because uh, they've, they've, they've looked at all the work we've done, they've done it again from their perspective uh, and the model they're proposing is keep the vast majority of services at both Epsom and St Helia uh, in the future but create a single acute specialist facility on one of the three sites. So you could either do that at Epsom, you could do it at Sutton or you could do it here. Um, uh, there's a lot of work the commissioners are leading to work out which of those three scenarios is their preferred one. Uh, so there's work on travel and access, there's work on the impact on deprived communities, there's an equalities impact analysis, and importantly, what is the impact on the other hospitals around us if patient uh, flows change. Uh, so all that work is underway. Uh, the aim is to get to <coughs> January where we can be, the CCGs can begin a public consultation on their preferred option, and the aim is to get to uh, next May, where the NHS makes a decision on what it would like to do. Um, at the moment, the CCGs are very actively trying to seek people's views about uh, the, the, the case, their case for change, the clinical model, and how they got down to a provisional shortlist. Uh, there's the link to the website and their website and the questions, and please, please answer them. Um, and that really is it. This is the, this is the slide I use uh, at the end of every uh, trust induction that I do every month. Uh, we have very committed staff. We've set out a clear, bl uh, a clear plan now to 2020 and beyond. Uh, there are a lot of challenges which we understand, and we really do aspire to deliver on our mission to provide great care to everybody every day. Oh, no, it's not the end, because it's got the objectives for 1819. How did I forget that? <laughs> So there are six of them, uh, which are very similar to this year's. We want to continue to provide safe and effective care uh, with respect and dignity. We're going to focus on sepsis, learning from deaths, critical outreach service, and seven-day working. Uh, we want to create a more positive patient experience that meets the expectations of our patients, families, and carers by investing a lot of money in our estate, which you've heard from from Trevor. Um, we want to provide responsive care that delivers the right treatment in the right place at the right time. So uh, the key things we've been set are deliver the a &E standard, which for us for the year works out at now 93.7% by the end of the year. Uh, deliver the new cancer standard, which is about 38 days. Uh, deliver the national guidance on referral to treatment, that's planned care, which for us is keep your, waiting your total waiting list no bigger at the end of the year than it is at the beginning. Have no one waiting more than 52 weeks. Then uh, be financially sustainable, which means deliver the deficit that Rakesh has uh, outlined. 
the uh, work in partnership, uh, so that's implement the Sutton Downs uh, adult community contract from October, deliver what we've agreed for Sutton Health and Care, and work with the commissioners on 2020 to 2030, and then ensure the organisation is well led, uh, and the key thing we want to do is improve our staff engagement. There we go. Now it says thank you, and we can do questions. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, if the join us up here. So we've got about uh, half an hour for questions on uh, what you've just heard or really anything. So we'll start. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman. I commend the singing at the beginning. It was excellent. I thought you might be singing all things bright and beautiful as well, based on Daniel's assessment. But I've got some questions on the finance side, if I may. Firstly, I read the rap with interest. Very little financial data was there, and I was surprised that there was no reference whatsoever to the forthcoming land sale at Epsom. And that's a post balance sheet event, so I hope it's been annotated in the accounts, has it? it so we've, we've had detailed discussions with the audit of KPMG. If that is a post balance sheet event or not, and it's not, it doesn't it's mean. It's not the, material, you mean? No, it, it doesn't meet the criteria of a post balance sheet event in the sense that. It wasn't it, signed off. It hasn't signed off. All it right, hasn't signed off. I understand. Right, thank you. The next question is this one. <clears throat> Obviously, we've gone through the numbers here in some detail, and you should be commended at the way you present this deficit of 13.7 for the year. But the underlying deficit is actually 39, because you've got to take out exceptional right. items. That's exactly and you know, that's really the highlight here, because you, again, this year coming, you've assumed you've got 14 million coming in on the, uh, the, the bonus fund, if you like and you're not necessarily going to get that. So in reality, what we're looking at is a trust that is actually on underlying performance, 39 million offside. So, so that's a realistic observation. Right. How does that compare with all other trusts? So, so if I answer the first part of the question. Sorry, if I answer the first part of the question. So you're right, the underlying deficit in 17, 18 was 39 million pounds, but the, the corporate objectives for the for 18 19 you'll note there were three there were three objectives associated with financial sustainability sure. and one of them was to reduce our underlying deficit sure. and we were in, we had lots of discussions with our regulators about what would be an achievable target and so that the plan for this financial year 18 19 is to reduce it from 39 to 32 million Right, underlying. Um, underlying deficit. Right. And so that is a key metric for us. And that's why. You've got 70 million improvements in there. Yes. I mean, so that's a big call. It, it's, a, it's a mass, as I said very briefly in my presentation, the financial challenge for 1819 is enormous. It's colossal. So, yeah. where do you really think it's going to end up? So, in the first quarter, we're, we're there or thereabouts at the moment, but the challenge gets harder and harder. It would do. Yeah. <laughs> so, what's the number? So at the it's moment, at the moment, it's too early. It's too early to, it's too early to okay. say anything. So you've got no. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for that answer. Anyway. So there's, there's one bit we haven't answered, which is how does our deficit compare to <coughs> yes. other hospitals? Yeah. Um, so, so most hospitals in the NHS have made a deficit. Sure. Um, you have to differentiate between those hospitals that have made a deficit because they haven't managed to manage themselves very well and those hospitals that have made a deficit because they have a massive structural problem, which means you can never break even. Right. We're in the latter part of that. So we have not been asked to have a trajectory to get to break even because the regulator can see it is impossible in the current service configuration with the current buildings that we have. So you're the, an exceptional case. So, really. so, so I think in many ways we are an exceptional yeah. case. Yeah. And if you look at the hospitals around us that have achieved um, financial stability or and or surplus. So there are several. Uh, so there is uh, Surrey and Sussex Trust, which is in Red Hill. There is St. Peter's right. in Chertsey. Uh, and there is the Frimley part of Frimley Health as opposed to the Wexham part of Frimley Health. Uh, and then there is the, um, so those three hospitals, trusts, all exhibit the service configuration and buildings that we wish to move to. So if you can provide acute services for over 400,000 people from a fit-for-purpose building, there is sufficient funding in the NHS to enable you to afford to deliver that in a sustainable way from lovely buildings and deliver all the quality standards. Thank and you. that is where we're trying to get to. All right, thank you. <coughs> Hiya. Um, 
thank you for allowing me to ask a question. Um, you were talking earlier about all the things that you are moving into St. Helia main building. Um, we know that you're not hitting the A&E standards. We know that you don't have enough beds. We know that you've had to shut children's departments to allow adults to be admitted to hospital. And yet you tell us that you're moving into the main building, several new shops, you're moving in paediatrics, um, maternity care, a new renal unit, all being, oh, and the pain management unit, all being moved into the main building. Raises two questions for me. What are you removing to give you room to move in all those things? And what are your plans and when do you expect to sell all those buildings at the back that you are conveniently emptying out? Okay, so I think there's a little bit of a mixed message there, Sandra. Some of the services that you mentioned are other hospitals, other sites. So if I pick on St. Helier at the moment, um, some of our retail facilities are very much in sort of corridor areas that wouldn't really be fit for clinical services. So such as WH Smith, it's really not large enough to have any clinical facility in it, indeed, at the Marks and Spencers. But what we are doing, um, we're working for a whole range of um, spaces that we've improved on in creating more more inpatient capacity and trying to focus at A, B and C block being more of an inpatient facility. So for instance we've moved phlebotomy out of um, C1 and we created that more into a, an inpatient ambulatory care facility. We're expanding round Mary Moore Ward, we've moved cardiology investigations out and we're creating much more oh, inpatient. So cardiology investigation, in fact, is a bit complicated, but it's going to where the diabetes centre is. And the diabetes centre is coming into the first floor of Ferguson House, should be opened um, by the end of the month. So we've, that's why we put some of our more of our outpatients, we're focusing into Ferguson House. So we've actually expand, ex expanded the, the facilities on the first floor to have... Um, outpatient functions such as audiology, um, psychiatric liaison and we're putting up their diabetes. So we're creating spaces that are moving outpatients in one location and inpatients in another space. So we're creating that sort of wall. We've also, such as this building has moved from the old PGMC space, we've created a massive space in the main hospital that can be much more focused for inpatient capacity. So when do you and expect to sell all that, um, all those buildings at the back that you are emptying out? So there's no current plans to sell any buildings at the back of the site. What we do know is that there's clinical risk around actually um, bringing patients from the, that back of the site into our main hospital. It's not really a great patient experience to move that. So what we are planning to do is to look at how can we bring services into the main hospital, co-locate them more effectively so it's the right environment for the patient and also that, that it's more accessible for them. But we will be looking at, looking at whether we demolish those buildings and, and look at how we address our car parking and we'll be working with the London Bar Sutton at some stage around that because obviously we don't own um, all of the uh, Epsom Hospital land. Well, I'm aware that you're putting pressure yeah. on Sutton Council to allow you to sell um, surplus, so-called surplus land and buildings, um, uh, to pro probably property developers. I'm aware that that's your plan, seeing your letters from Savile to Sutton Council. Um, it looks from an outside perspective as if you are moving into a hospital that's already overstretched services at the back of the hospital so they are a nice neat package ready to demolish and sell off. So, so the other way of looking at it Sandra is it looks like to most people we're spending a lot of money on Epsom and St Helier hospitals to make them rather better places to be treated in and for staff to work in in the next few I that's years. What you want I think, it to look like. I'm not I think, sure it I think it's, like. for me it's very important in terms of the, the estate strategy is that we're investing our money, it's a lot of money, £100 million, pounds. we're investing it into the right buildings that we, we want to maintain, we want to try and keep them running. So in whatever scenario we're looking at 20, 20, 20, 30, we're still looking at the main A, B and C blocks being there and we're investing the money into to keeping it there, improving the patient uh, environment and say co cohorting uh, patients in the right environment. So all of the inpatients in that main block, all the outpatients closer to the car park where a lot of that traffic's in and out. And we're doing that on both sides. We're trying to cohort the right environment. So, so like we've moved all of the corporate offices off of the acute facilities, all in around where we can put patient care. We've moved that, put them into a corporate facility off site. So we, we, we're really much trying to 
cohort patients in the right environment and use our money wisely. Because even though we've got 100 million pounds, I said our backlog is 126 million, and we're also trying to improve our clinical facilities as well. I did notice that you were talking about a catchment area of 400 million. Five years ago, that catchment area was described by you as 500 million. So your catchment area has decreased markedly when the population's actually grown by something like five or 10%. So that's, so no, that's not so the tr talked about so, 500, well, let's get it into thousands yeah, rather than millions, because 400 million would be like I Europe. Um, the, um, uh, so the, uh, the current catchment of Epsom and St Helia is 492,000 people. And what I was saying is, when asked the question by the gentleman in front of you about other hospitals, they, all those other hospitals exhibit a catchment for their one site of more than 400,000 people, is what I said. But you must too by now, surely. So our combined, our, the catchment of both hospitals is 492,000. Still. Still, it hasn't That's changed. Remarkable. But the, but, but the, you've got 200, just under 200,000 people who use Epsom as their DGH, and you've got around 300,000 people just under who use St. Helier as their DGH that gets you the 492,000. But neither site has over 400,000 people using the site as the DGH. That is the, does that make sense? So the total is fine, just not in the way it is uh, configured to enable you to deliver the quality services with the finances that the NHS has available in fit for purpose buildings. Forgive me for not believing that those numbers shouldn't have increased over the last five or ten years. Yes, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm more familiar with Epsom Hospital. My concern is there's a lot of meetings taking place, um, various meetings taking place. They're all London centric. We also are aware a lot of use Epsom Hospital from their back end and places like that. And there don't seem to be that many of these different clinical care meetings being held convenient for those people, especially if they're like me, can no longer drive public transport to most of these London centric meetings is impossible unless I use a taxi. That's the first point. Secondly, yesterday I was in the main entrance of Epsom Hospital and there were people there wanting to use the public conveniences, particularly the ladies. And one of those cubicles even I have trouble getting into, and I'm not a big person. <laughs> and also, I'm aware you have been seen for what's happening in the various buildings. When will that be public knowledge, please? So, sorry, that's three questions. Oh, and the list is the other thing. There's still problems with the list in Epsom. Okay, so, so I can pick up lifts and the toilets, so if that's yeah. okay. Okay. So, so in terms of the, the public toilets, I totally uh, uh, agree with you. The yeah. Derby entrance toilets aren't fit for purpose. They're really cramped, really poor. They they're have trouble yeah, I, I, them. yeah. I'm not. I'm not proud of them. I have to say that they're, they're, they're very. Poor. They're, they're very constrained about what I can do because I've got X-ray on one yeah. side and that. And I think what what you'll find um, over by January, we're going to be reorganising um, all of our outpatient functions. So yeah. we'd have the first floor would open to a, new, a brand new outpatient facilities and the whole of that Headley wing outpatients will be relocated. Um, so we will find that there'll be less traffic and therefore they won't really be main public toilets. So we can actually adjust them to the local area and won't have so much footfall going through there. So that's one positive. Um, in terms of the, the lifts, I assume you're referring to some of the, the significant breakdowns yes. we've had at yeah. Wells Wing. I think, as, as we mentioned, in terms of our, our significant £62 million of critical infrastructure backlog, my lifts are very much in that facility. We've got a, a big challenge around the investment in terms of improving our lifts. Um, we have really been focused on that. We've got over, I think, £300 million, sorry, uh, 
three million pounds now on lift investment in in this year. Majority of that's at Epsom in terms of the yeah. well, uh, the Wells Wing lift and also for this swelly up lift that have caused us problems. Um, it is unfortunate the weather hasn't helped them either as they're quite old and and tiled. Um, but we do have a plan. We're really much we've got them operational now. We've got some more further work to go down that we've got to plan because we also got to take the lifts out for like eight weeks to try and do some even uh, major improvements. If you're relying on one lift, that's a risk. So we're, we're acutely aware we put in significant capital now into those lifts. Um, and, and I think in the near future, we will resolve that issue. And then on the meetings. Yeah. So if you go to the Improving Healthcare Together website, you'll discover that on the 23rd of July in the afternoon, there's a meeting in Epsom Methodist Church. And yes. yeah. on the 26th of July, yeah. In the evening, I'm, I'm yeah. Well so, so there is there are as, there are as many yeah. meetings in Epsom as there are in Sutton as there are in Merton. So they've spread their meetings out across the catchment. Yeah. Um, but there is one other issue. Um, you've got daycare units, daycare patients on trolleys coming past where you've got W. H. Smith and also M. And S. People are literally walking past these patients eating food. Surely that can't be in the best interest of patients coming from day surgery where they're having to wait a long time for lifts that aren't always working. So I think we, we recognise the lift issue as well. And the piece. No, it's not so much. Yeah, it's but in terms of the, the things. So do you know where the day case is? One of the things that we are doing is providing an increased um, day case ward recovery space on the ground floor um, where Ebersham ward is at the moment. So I mean, it will be, I mean, that won't be the good path there. I've seen patients coming out and you've got people standing beside them and cramming into You've also got food being taken up with these patients to the various wards at meal time. So that can't be high. So, so I think the challenge we have with Wells Wing is that it has two main passenger lifts, lifts that also I have to bring my waste, my food and a lot of my facility services up. In a new modern hospital you'd have a very separate service yes, list that you'd put that in, would not be entertained anywhere near a patient bed. It's not ideal. We do try to move a lot of our, our food and our supplies and stuff early in the morning around that, but there are times, and we're also always willing to look at it as an option we can look at. We also try and encourage staff not to use the lifts and, and not to um, take food up around there. But I think just in terms of where we've got our theatres and our facilities, it, it's, it's a challenge, and I think yeah. we've just got to try and do the best we can. So something is likely to be happening. We're certainly providing increased um, recovery ward space for, for the day. Because vision. this comes back to people handling food and not using the, the um, gel. gel and that. So, so I, think I normally carry gel in my bag with me to make sure. So, so I, I think I don't have any evidence, and I, you know, on the contrary, I'd argue that in terms of food hygiene, all of our hostess are very well trained and, and very particular around um, washing hands before and after for the meals. We do have a, a, a process of actually preparing the patient um, with hand wipes before the meal as well. So. Okay. Yes. You say about lifts, I thought there were a couple of service lifts Inside of, inside of the, um, yes, so there is two service lists, uh, uh, yeah, they're broke as well, but equally I can't bring waste and a lot of materials up there because those service lifts go directly into all the main kitchens, so we can't bring a lot of our stuff through a kitchen, so they're predominantly for um, our food service, those lifts, and, and I think if I'm, they are operational now, or one is anyway. And you're making all these changes Chest clinic was next to bloods and x-ray and other things. They're all down ultrasound. They're all down that corridor. And now you're going to spend all this money to move it. <coughs> you know, it was ideal, the care. That's what we need, proper care. It really, really wasn't ideal. So to have all those people waiting in the main hospital corridor, so the number of accidents and things that happen where people stick their leg out when someone's walking past or a trolley kn knocks into them is huge. It is completely not acceptable. And the quality of the consulting rooms is also not acceptable. There are loads of them that are far too small where you can't do the procedures that you need to do. There is almost nothing right about the outpatient configuration in the main.
main body of Epsom Hospital, creating a whole block that is devoted to outpatients that is purpose designed, which is where we'll get to in, by the end of the next year, is exactly what is needed to provide outstanding good care in Epsom Hospital now and in the future. And in the new block, in the Woodcock Bean, are you putting in a brand new lift? Yes. So there's already one brand new lift being installed in the main stairwell and we're putting a second lift in that will have trolley access as well um, for emergencies but also to give us some resilience because of all the outpatients going on the first and second floor in the time being that we need some resilience around lifts. So yes, there's another one being installed and, and that will be um, January time. Right. And you didn't answer the question about the land sale. Yeah. How many uh, people applied or gave a bid and what decision was made? So there are lots of questions from Epsom Council uh, that and uh, that have, uh, we will reply to it all by the middle of next week. Oh, and in the Naylor report, it states that you shouldn't sell off uh, buildings that have accommodation. You should consider your staff first. Where are the staff who occupy those rooms in Rowan House going to go? So, so I think any member of staff, or even indeed yourself, would not see that as fit for purpose staff accommodation. Uh, it's very poor, it's a single room, you don't have en suite facilities, you have to share kitchen, toilet, showers and even a, a, communal, loun a communal lounge. They're not really fit for um, staff accommodation. I certainly am embarrassed by the state of them. Um, we, we've done a number of things, um, so a lot of our facilities, we've, we've um, got new accommodation or rent accommodation in Temple Road, Epsom, uh, which is 30 units that we've, we've, we've provided for our staff. We still have Woodcote Lodge that um, provides us, I think, with 24 units for, for, for staff, and we're actually working with... Yeah, it's a St Kilda Trust um, facility and we're also working, got a number of other housing associations that we're working with in terms of key work accommodation that's fit for purpose but actually are, that's their day job, the housing associations provide that sort of accommodation. We're here about providing health care, it's not really, um, we need to make sure that providing key work accommodation but I don't think it's necessarily um, the right thing for the trust to be actually providing that facility. But I mean, the building there, the outside is good brickwork. It could be converted into units, self-contained units, and people are on start site, and if they want to pop home during their lunch hour, they can. <coughs> but sending them down to the town, in rent. So, 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 so we, you, you, we did look at that as a, as, a, as a potential, and the cost of sorting out the building far are in excess of what the building is actually worth. And we don't have the capital to spend on accommodation. We need to spend our capital on sorting out the patient <coughs> areas of the hospital. Um, and the, um, uh, I, I suppose I'm thinking, wouldn't it be good as a part of the land sale at Epsom, uh, one, of the op one of the uses for some of the land is key worker affordable accommodation for our staff that was modern and fit for purpose. So the, uh, so, 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 so rather than everyone trying to stop something happening, why don't, why don't we get into what you, what would be a really good use for some of that land? And when I showed, a, well, when we showed a number of the councillors around in Epsom, that was right on their top of their list of things that they think would be a good use for some of the land. Well, do you know what? Our staff would think that would be a good use for some of the land, too. So we ought to be trying to work out how we could achieve that. I it to private developers. It's not going to private. And flats going. No. No. It's got to be sold to someone who has the no, capital, the be because where do we get the money from to build housing when what we're actually sitting on is a massive building problem of buildings that aren't fit for purpose for patient care. And if we started spending our money on housing as opposed to spending money on patient care, I think there might quite rightly be a lot of complaints that said that is not a good use of <laughs> NHS money. Right, we've got the forest of hands has suddenly gone up, but actually Morris over in the corner had his hand up a few minutes ago, so if you go first and then we'll try and get round. Thank you very much, Chair, and thanks for your presentation, everyone. And I apologise, Daniel, I had to pop out while you were speaking. Um, a couple of questions. Out the front at the moment, you've got a banner saying £100 million being spent. I've heard 12, 42, now 100, so is it... 
or a hundred, and how much is it on Helia, and is it going to be completed by 2021? I've got two other questions after that, but they're much shorter. So, so in terms of the £100 million, that relates to 2016-17, last financial year. This financial year, 2018-19, sorry, 17-18, 18-19, and next financial year. So it's £100 million over those three years. Um, and as we said, we spent £30, 000, uh, sorry, 30 million last year. Um, we're planning to spend 50 this year, so that leaves us... 20-ish uh, for next year. Um, I can't tell you um, quickly off the top of my head what the split is, um, but there's a significant um, investment on both our sites. Right, okay. And it's going to be completed by 2021? So, so 100 million is, is, is completed in next financial year, which is 2019-20. Oh, right, okay. Good. So March, well March 2020. Is, is, is this building work going to cause you any problems during the winter period, sort of January, February, when one expects very cold weather. <laughs> so, 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 so sitting at the back of the room is Dan, who's our Chief Operating Officer. Uh, so we spend hours with the estates team and the clinical teams working out how do you do the building works at the same time as run a hospital. And we're about to get into the most complicated thing ever, which is we try to rebuild the inside of the a &E department at St. Helier at the same time as keeping the a &E department running. It's going to be one of the biggest logistical feats going uh, and is going to require a huge amount of patience from staff and uh, real patience as they we have to develop some pretty circuitous ways round to get to different bits of the department while we're doing the building work. It's going to be uh, really, really complicated. Uh, but you can't close an a &E department, uh, so you've got to find a way of sorting it out while it's being used. I think there's a great communications exercise here well, as well. Yeah. Well, that's part of the reason why we put that huge banner up, because it says on the banner, please bear with us while we sp sp right. spend all yeah, this money, because it's... But, but a lot of people in Merton <laughs> won't know that, <laughs> and they might very well be a patient at that time. Mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the last question, and I'm going to wind up now, is you've got Epsom uh, Health and Care Unit, you've got Sutton Health and health and care unit arriving. Um, when I was cabinet member for health and older people services, I tried pushing them to put the two health workers together, which was the PCT then, and now, uh, and, and then the, 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 the council. Are they talking to you about this? Because it seems from everything that you said, they've been omitted other than one reference to the, the, the scrutiny panel, which really has got no legs at all. Are you talking about Merton or Sutton? Merton. So, oh, no, I'm only talking Merton. So, so because we're a really small provider of healthcare in Merton, we are not an integral part of the joining together of the, uh, the health and care system in Merton. So the CCG is leading it with Merton Council, and it is mostly involving the GP Federation in Merton and St George's, and Central London Community Health. But really, we are, we are only the district hospital for about 30,000 people out of the 200,000 people in yeah. the borough. So we, 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 uh, we, we, we pay attention and we'll respond to what they say, but we don't have a seat round the uh, table. Right, is there a reason why not? Well, because, because we're not, so, so St George's are the predominant district right. hospital okay. for the borough of Merton, so they're, so they're there, and they talk to us about the things they need us to uh, help them with, but we, we really are, um, our catchment into Merton is really quite small. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, you, you have one already, so I'm going to get okay. it back. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, just to say that um, obviously my position as a councillor on Epsom and your borough council, uh, we, will look with, uh, we will look with much more favour on any application to sell the land if we can be assured that the land will be used for social care facilities of one sort, like a nursing home, plus the accommodation for key workers in the hospital, which would at least, I think, justify the, uh, the sale of the, of, the, of the land. What we don't want is to simply to be sold off to create 
three and four bedroom luxury homes, which frankly we have enough of. So, so the um, so we know that is the council's view. Yeah. Yeah. That the, the council is the planning authority. Yeah. We need to work with the council to come up with a master plan for the yes. for the land, so that if we have to go to the commercial sector, which, then we're doing it in a way that everyone is going to be aligned about what the what the use of the land should be. So that, those are the conversations we actually need. Well, we have been, we've already begun to have, and we need to continue to have to get to a a, a, a place where we can all agree. That that would that would be our that would be our aspiration. Um, but just like with housing, we, we are not a nursing home provider either. So so we need to encourage a, a provider of that service to be part of the answer. The whole point is, or the new NHS vision is linked up thinking between health and social. Yeah. This is why it would be a very good use of that of that land to develop social care facilities to complement what you've already got in Epsom Health and Care. Yeah. So, so, so we don't disagree. So we, we, we need we need to find a way of working constructively with you on how to, on how to get there. And we will certainly do do that. We're going to get to that. Just on that point, um, and if I could make the point to someone from the Epsom Borough Council, um, the anticipated growth in population is by 2026 in Sutton a 12.2% increase and in Epsom a 15.8% increase. Now, um, personally, <coughs> as, a, as a patient, um, my concern would be that any land remains available for the increased uh, requirement for healthcare. <coughs> so rather than selling it off, whether it be for housing or for anyone, I would rather it was available for the increased uh, provision of healthcare. Um, you mentioned the integrated and you've managed, um, which I'm delighted, a 6% reduction in the over 65s being admitted. Is there some correlation then between the figures that say you can save being admitted into acute care um, that justifies this removal of acute services from Epsom and St. Helier if it goes to just one site? I, that, that's the, the, the bit I'm missing. So you can join the first two, you can, you can join your two points together. Yeah. So the population. We have, we have more people, and they're living longer, and there's more health care need. It's definitely correct. Yes. At the same time, what we can see is there are lots of people admitted to hospital who can be looked after really well at home and actually would, be, would prefer to be at home. Yes, and our modelling says the reason why you have to keep broadly the same number of beds going forward as you do today is because the increase in demand is being offset by reduction in length of stay and reduction in admissions. So you end up in broadly the same number of patients as being admitted as you do today. The total number of patients the NHS will be caring for will be way, way higher, and there'll be need to be an increase in the NHS and the care workforce to do that because there are more patients needing care. I would just question the modelling because 6% um, reduction, I, I didn't see to reduce the pressure on any of the winter. So this this last winter was exceptional, and so and, and you have to and you and you have to you have to plan for for the exceptional. But the the thing that didn't happen in either Epsom or St Helia, but did happen in lots of other hospitals, was queues of ambulances because there was no place to. I don't. Well, that's um, not true. The, so there, there was there were photographs of ambulances yeah. outside. So, so but but not ambulances not being able to unload their patients for hours on. End like they were in other places. So, so we have broadly. at the beginning of a trust board so, meeting. So you couldn't admit patients from, from St George's who'd been transferred because St George's couldn't cope. Your A and E couldn't admit them because your A and E couldn't move patients into the main hospital because you haven't got enough beds. So, so we have sufficient bed capacity in our hospitals for delivering the the volume of activity that we're required to provide. The, but in peaks, of act, in peaks of demand, the, there, is always, there are always going to be some issues. But the thing that we did much, much better this year than last year was we didn't have to cancel all our planned care because we have, the, we have managed to keep, we've managed to keep the medical bed base uh, much more in the medicine beds and much less in is the surgery the beds. the children's department to add up acute patients? So, so that is one of the escalation areas that we used. And 
what we're doing this year at Epsom uh, is we are co-locating both the paediatric wards into the same floor because uh, we only have the pedi paediatric activity to support one set of paediatric services, not two. And then we're going to properly convert one of the paediatric wards to be the escalation space for the winter for adults and make it an adult friendly environment as opposed to a child friendly environment. Uh, and the scheme has the support of many of the clinicians at Epsom because we'll actually end up providing much better paediatric care because we won't have the teams on the one team on two floors, they'll all be on the same floor. The President of the Royal Academy of Emergency Medicine says we need more beds, not fewer, and STP plans, which this is, are potentially catastrophic and people will die. Would you argue with his, him and his college? Uh, I absolutely argue with that people will die, Colin. Well, that's what he said. So, so the, uh, the, the first seven weeks this year, 10,000 extra deaths as a result of the changes which you are helping to implement. So, so 10,000 extra people died in England in the first seven weeks of this year. Have you no shame? So, so I think we need to take some of the emotion away from this. And um, we, we know that every year there are more people die in winter than in summer. And the large, the, the, there is increased um, incidence of very severe chest infections. All is increased. The discounted by the study that yielded the 10,000 extra deaths. They weren't extra as compared with the average for the year. They were extra compared with the same period the previous year. So, 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 so Mr. Ash, we're in a place that you're wanting us to talk about national data. We're trying to do the annual review of Epsom and St. Helia, and I think the questions are not the right questions for this forum. Really sorry. Uh, we're going to have to end. This is the final question. Thank you very much, Mr. Um, Chairman. In fact, it's for you, actually. Right. Um, I attended the um, Health and Liaison Panel session in the Town Hall in Epsom, yeah. and Daniel gave an excellent exposition, aided by um, Andrew Dimitriades. And the thing that he said gave me great comfort, oddly enough, about the future of the direction and Epsom Hospital, etc., etc. Now, obviously, those were verbal commitments. And I'm wondering whether you, in charge of the trust, could actually confine those to writing now, so we're all crystal clear about what we're doing here. Is that a possibility? If Daniel and uh, Andrew Dimitriades gave verbal commitments, yes. um, I'm perfectly prepared to endorse those commitments that they gave. Right. Um, whether they come in writing or whether you're happy to take my assurance here. Um, I, I don't mind whichever way. Yeah. I mean, and I'm not saying get, I mean, I'll give you an example. Yes, I'll, that, I'll yeah, it depends on which commitments they were. Saying, yeah, 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 no, exactly. Um, no, I mean, one comment was made was that neither Epsom General Hospital nor St. Helia are at risk of closure. Correct, Those that's services true. services will be centralised. Yes, that's, yes that, that's what we said today. I recognise yeah. that absolutely. However, this is the bit, this is the rider. For most folk, Epsom General Hospital will remain as accessible as at present. That was the bit that I'd like some assurance of. Yes, that, that is correct. For people who, I think it is something like for 80, perhaps slightly more, 80% of, 85%, Daniel's just said, of yeah. individual people's visits, what you might call a hospital episode, yeah. Yeah. nothing will change. That's exactly what he said, and you know, that's what I'm asking you to yeah. confirm, and you just have And I am confirming that. And, and the last one that was quite uh, germane, and, and it still is germane, having regard to what we've looked at numerically for the upcoming year, all land sales proceeds will be invested in the Epsom General Hospital. In other words, the land sales from Epsom the state. That's correct. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much, sir. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for coming. We're, the, we're finished now, Bess, because we've got to get on to our... I just wanted to say about um, when I went to the SDCCG meeting last week, they said that um, people would have to find out about the meetings on the internet. Not everyone's got the internet. I think they need to go house to house yeah. if they're going to be open and transparent. That's a question for Ben, not yes. for us. But we'll convey your views. Right. Thank you very much for coming to the uh, annual public meeting, and we'll see you next time.